All right. So Hannah, it helps if you turn off your camera with your connectivity, doesn't it? I totally understand. Oh, I can't hear you. You're muted. Um, yeah, a little bit. It helps it like it doesn't have to load. As long. No, I understand. No, go ahead. I totally understand turning the camera off for connectivity. <clears throat> so I just want to remind everybody that the next assignment, which will be will be beginning in about 10 days from now, um, is based on this book. So just make sure you get a copy of this book. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have an audio version of this book to post, but it's available pretty cheaply. Hannah, I think you got one from the bookstore. Evan, did you get a copy of this book yet? Yeah, I did. When I, the same time I got this book, I just had to find it. So. Good, yeah. So you have 10 days to find it. Um, what I'm going to be helping you deal with today is the big question about the Mapuche. And the big question is, did the Spanish conquer the Mapuche? And of course, that's a loaded question. It's not a simple yes or no. So that's what I'm looking forward for you to develop based on what you read in Isabella Gende book and based on the couple films I um, assigned and this, uh, the couple lectures I'm going to be offering about the Mapuche. <clears throat> By now, you know what, who Felipe was, right? Excuse me, and can I pick on you, uh, Evan or and Becky? Who did Felipe end up being, this character that we meet, that reveals himself in chapter five? Felipe was a young boy who turned against the uh, Spaniards. Yeah, he was just a spy for all his young life, right? He went in there with the, with the purpose of learning a lot about the Spanish in order to know how to fight them better. So as you know, um, his real name, his Mapuche name is Lautoro, Lautoro. So today's chorus during the le uh, today's lecture would is what would Lautoro do given these circumstances? And this is a painting painted in the 1900s celebrating Felipe turned into Mapuche warrior Lautoro. And here are the Mapuche over here on the right, having learned how to use the Spanish cannon. Here are the Mapuche having adopted the Spanish horse. And here are the Mapuche using guns that they stole from the Spanish, guns and swords. So La Toro was an instrumental, real historical figure. Isabella Gender, the author, did not make him up. He was a real historical figure. And before I go further, um, if I can pick on you, Hannah and Evan, what struck you about La Toro? What struck you about that shift? And did you see it coming? Did you see it from like, man? Can you repeat that one more time? You cut out a lot. Did you see it coming that Felipe transformed into La Toro and turned on the Spanish? Well, like, I didn't see it coming. Well, like, I never really trusted him because he just appeared there one day and didn't say anything. So I never, I never thought he was trustworthy, but I never really thought, I never really thought he was going to do anything. I didn't think his character was really going to go anywhere. I thought he was just, you know, an added thing to the story. But. Yeah, oh heck no, he's one of the main rebel protagonists, so good, 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 good. So let me give you a brief thumbnail sketch of Chile today. Chile today has one of the highest gross domestic product per capita in Latin America. In other words, Chile is one of the wealthiest countries in Latin America. This is a photograph taken a few years ago of downtown Santiago very sophisticated, they have an opera house, they have museums, they have high fi uh, big finance lives, um, is stationed in Chile. And this is all in the backdrop of these big Andean mountains that you're reading so much about. So here's an image of modern day Chile, so you get an idea. If you took a demographic look at Chile, meaning if you looked at who lived there, today there's about 16.5 million people who live there and almost 10% of them identify as indigenous. Okay, so 10% of uh, Chilean people, what's that about 1.6 million are indigenous. The vast majority of those who identify as indigenous are Mapuche, right? So there still are hundreds of thousands of Mapuche people still living in Chile. Here's a photograph of a couple of Mapuche leaders, both um, young and old. 
And this is a image of their flag. This is the Mapuche flag in the background. <clears throat> Again, there's about 1.5 million Mapuche in Chile and a couple hundred thousand in Argentina living today. Here is a photograph of a Mapuche rights march from about three years ago. Um, here's a, a photograph from the protests of last year that shows uh, Capulican. Remember who this guy was, Capulican, from your reading? Remember the Mapuche guy who was uh, holding the log for a couple days? Evan or Becky, you remember that guy? Um, didn't he, uh, he was like a Mapuche commander or something, and he got the job by holding the log for like a day? Yeah, that crazy test of endurance that actually happened. This is an actual Mapuche test of endurance to see who's the strongest warrior. So he's commemorated today in Santiago, Chile with the statue. And look what the protesters did. Do you see what's hanging from La Toro's arm? I'm sorry, from Capulican's arm? I don't know if you can make that out. Can you make that out, Evan? It appears to be a head. Yes. Pedro's head. Yeah. So what the protesters did is they went to a statue of a conquistador, sawed off his head, and then tied it to La Toro's arm. A straight up anti-Spanish, pro-Mapuche, right, political theater right here. And in the background, you can see the Mapuche flag. So my point here is that it's still going. This fight between the Mapuche people and the Chilean state is still going today. Again, you're going to meet Capulican, or have you have met him in chapter six. And here's another image of him in a warrior stance. And finally, just another image from current day. This is last year. This is the actual gravesite of Pedro Valdivia, and it's been defaced. Pedro Valdivia's bust has been whacked off. There's spray paint on his grave that says Fuera, which means get out of here. And the sign that's taped to the gravesite says, <clears throat> the Mapuche people rise in dignity and greet the Chilean people, right? A very sarcastic way of saying, get out of here. We don't like the continued Chilean practice. And it seems to me, this is just further evidence that Inez Suarez was right. On page 310 of the Isabel Allende book, Inez Suarez says, I should hate them, but I can't. They are my enemies, but I admire them, the Mapuche, because I know that if I were in their place, I would die fighting for my land as they are doing. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna give you right now is a history of the Mapuche that starts where the book ends. So let me just ask, have you two taken advantage of looking at the slides that go with the chapters and are those helpful? Some of them. Um, I did I did find that a lot of them were similar to your lectures and I thought that that was, that was good because it kind of gave a good overview. Um, but I do use them for most of the assignments. But I hope you do, and you can just scroll through them. They just show you some paintings of all the images, all the conquistadors and the Mapuche people and some maps and things. So I hope they're, they help you ground yourself further in the material. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so as you know, in the 1540s, the Spanish and the Af Africans and Yanaconas arrive and invade the Mapuche territory. Right here's a painting from Juan Poma, capturing the Mapuche over here on the left versus the Spanish over there on the right. Now we're in new, now we're in new territory. So the book ends in the 1540s, and the book ends with Inés Suárez saying, "Wow, we're going to keep fighting them for who knows how long." So about a hundred years later, the Spanish colonists in Chile are tired of war and they sue for peace. So what happens were representatives of Mapuche, people, La Toro's long gone, Pedro Valdivia's long gone, Inés Suarez is long gone, but their descendants remained in Chile. So descendants of the Spanish conquistadors and Mapuche leaders get together and sign a treaty. 
It's called the Treaty of Kilim, this Q, U, Q word right here. Excuse me. And in the treaty, the Spanish state, right, recognizes the Mapuche independence. And the Spanish colonial state um, gives the Mapuche what they earned, right? This uh, free Mapuche state right here. So this huge swath of land in red is Mapuche land. And this is the only example in all of the Spanish colonial domain in the Americas in which the Spanish recognize a Native American's right to live and their land. Um, the size of the land in 1641 is right here, right, the one second from the left, and it's about the size of Virginia. This is not a small piece of land. It's huge. It's 38,000 square miles. How do you think the Mapuche fared during this period of uh, independence? What do you think? <clears throat> the Mapuche are given independence for a couple hundred years. How do you think they did? La Toro and all, all their descendants. Evan, can I pick on you? <clears throat> um, I think I would think that they'd do well, but I'm not quite sure. I would have a feeling they had their downfall in some way. Yeah, your your first one was right. So for about 220 years, the Spanish more or less left the Mapuche alone. And during this time of independence, there was really a cultural and population renaissance, rebirth of the Mapuche population. The population increased, the Mapuche continued their traditional practices, whether it was continuing their traditional ball game, right? They <clears throat> adopted the Spanish sheep and the Spanish horses. Because remember, La Toro stole horses and sheep, and right, they adopted them and made wool out of the sheep, used the sheep for food. So they benefited and ended up, you know, having this cultural renaissance, as I said. <clears throat> Fast forward to 1810, eight, in the 18, early 1800s, it was an age of revolution throughout Latin America, and in Chile, they earned their independence in 1810 from Spain. So Chile now is an independent nation, a lot like the United States won its independence from um, England in the 1780s. So the early Chilean nation's policy towards the Mapuche was to also recognize them as an independent state. So this Mapuche independence and cultural renaissance continues through the early 1800s. <clears throat> However, by the 1860s, the Chilean government changed its policy. A lot like the United States had switched its policy. And just as the United States was extending west, conquering more native tribes in North America, the Chilean nation wanted to extend south and conquer the Mapuche. So in 1866, Chile, Chile passed the Indigenous Reservation Law, which opened up lands to more um, Chileans. So here's the chorus. If you were La Toro during this Indigenous Reservation Law, what do you think he would do? Hannah or Evan, can I pick on you? Yeah, he would probably, uh, well, before he would fight, he would probably, send spies and I don't know it seems like his strategy would be to send spies to get as much information as possible and then to wage war against them what do you think Evan do you think she's on to something I do oh I heck yeah they fought right they organized they got together because remember this is 220 years of being virtually independent of Spanish and Chilean authorities so this turned into a 20-some year thing the Chilean government called the pacification of the Mapuche. In other words, a 20-year-long war to have the Chilean army try to conquer the Mapuche. And this time, there is a series of inventions, technological innovations that gave the Chilean government the big upper hand. So this thing was invented right? The Winchester repeating rifle was invented in the United States. 
and also the Gatling gun. So these machines of war, right, like a machine gun, could shoot out so much more lead, right? Could you imagine how would Latoro's troops do against the Gatling gun? Not well at all, because they did not have one themselves. So during this 20-some year war of pacification, the Chilean government waged against the Mapuche, 10,000 Mapuche were killed. In 1883, the Mapuche were forced onto reservations, having been militarily defeated. Not all the way defeated, but militarily, um, yeah, in a sense, defeated. That's, I'm gonna, interested to see what argument you all make when you answer the question. So not only did they attempt to conquer the Mapuche with military um, superiority, but what's another way you could maybe turn Mapuche into Chileans? You know what I mean? If any of you all know about US history, what's a way in which in America we tried to turn Native Americans into Americans? You know what I'm getting at? Have them maybe accept our religion? Yeah. Evan, you want to take a gander? Make them, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you do. You're getting it. You, um, so it was called um, assimilation. So you're exactly, they tried to convert Mapuche into, into Christianity. They tried to teach Mapuche the Spanish language, right? Turn them ethnically into Spaniards. So here's what the Chilean government said. Assimilation of the Mapuche people and the eradication of their culture would be the best thing for national unity. So exactly, they tried to turn Mapuche into Chileans through schooling, through boarding schools. This is the same policy that the United States was attempting with its Native American population. Excuse me, if you ever take my US history course, we talk about this Carlisle Indian School in which 15,000 Native American young people went through the doors of this school in the attempt to turn these Native Americans into settler Americans. Okay. <clears throat> What's more, now that Mapuche were put into reservations, the Chilean government once again sold Mapuche lands. So by the 1880s, the Mapuche lands had diminished to these little white dots in the center frame. I don't know if you can make it out, but the point is there's a lot less acreage of Mapuche land. So it's like Pac-Man, slowly but surely the Mapu there's Mapuche land loss. <clears throat> and culturally in Chile, the Chilean government was romanticizing sort of the ancient Mapuche people. And I don't think there's a better um, data point or example of that than this school children's book about Lautaro. This book aimed at school children is called La Toro, the Young Liberator of the Arauco. Arauco, Araucanía is the name of another name for the Mapuche land. So on one hand, they're romanticizing this famous old Mapuche warrior, him on his horse with his staff of power. But in reality, in 1962, there was yet another law that allowed all the Mapuche land be open for public use. A lot like what the United States did to Native American land in the West, turning, for example, Yellowstone into a national park, turning Yosemite into a national park, turning <clears throat> Lassen into a national park, opening it up to non-Native peoples and thereby pushing out the Mapuche from their traditional land use. So, <clears throat> If La Toro was alive in 1962, what do you think he would do? Evan or Hannah, given this opening up of Mapuche land? All right, remember, this is our course. What would La Toro do? Evan or Hannah? I think he would probably fight back. He would probably what? Fight back. Fight back, okay, yeah, that's the whole, that's the whole course. He would fight. He would fight. He would fight. So that's what Mapuche did. Um, in 1970, the Mapuche strategy became to occupy the lands that they lost. And this is an actual image of Mapuche 
uh, young men in this case, occupying territory in which Chilean settlers came to dominate. This is nothing new. Uh, Native Americans throughout Americas from the San Francisco Bay, this is um, an Alcatraz occupation. This is the Native American occupation of Alcatraz Island. Alcatraz, as you may know, um, is a former penitentiary, but now it's a national park. <clears throat> so just as the United States Native Americans were occupying Alcatraz and demanding land back, so were Chilean, so were the Native Mapuche in Chile. And it just so happened, this coincided, oh, yay, Aaron, we have another participant. Let's invite Aaron. <clears throat> Hello, Aaron. Welcome. Yay. We have a small but mighty group of Hannah, Evan, and Aaron. <clears throat> so, Evan, we're about, Aaron, we're about halfway through this Mapuche discussion. I'm recording it so you can check the first part out um, later on when I upload it, okay? Okay, sounds good. So, it just so happened that in 1970, um, Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile. What name does that remind you of? His last name. Does it remind you of another name you might know about Chilean history? Uh, Isabel Allende? Yeah, this is Isabel Allende's uncle. Okay. So Isabel Allende's uncle is elected president. And he was elected president by a, cross, um, a crossing of student groups, working groups, uh, tin mining groups, and Mapuche people who could vote. <clears throat> and he supported Mapuche rights. In 1972, during the presidency of Salvador Allende, the Mapuche won legal recognition for existing, right? So in other words, they had the legal recognition to exist as a people, a lot like certain Native American peoples here in the United States are legally recognized as indigenous people. But equally important to our, the thread I'm weaving through this lecture is that the Mapuche won collective land holding rights. In other words, they won land back. And this was a big, big deal. And here's a um, photograph <clears throat> published in Life magazine showing Mapuche leaders meeting with members of the Chilean government talking about land holding rights. However, not everybody in Chile nor in the United States was happy about this. For example, the longtime Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, um, he was the Secretary of State to President Nixon at the time. He said, quote, I do not think we should delude ourselves that an agenda takeover in Chile would not present a massive problem for us. Why might the United States not support the presidency of um, Allende? Why can you guess? Possibly because um, Native Americans from North America might get ideas from, I don't know, from like how the Mapuche were doing down in Chile. Yeah, you're exactly right. On one hand, it's a model of Native American protests actually resulting in some positive policy change. Yeah, you're exactly right, Hannah. <clears throat> and also something I didn't tell you, by the early 1900s, the United States companies, private companies, were the number one investors in all of Latin America, including Chile. For example, US-based US copper mining, US-based aluminum mining, right, had invested millions of dollars in resource extraction in Chile. Um, in fact, in 1956, half of all of Chilean e exports were copper, okay? And what's significant about copper? Why is copper so important in our modern industrialized economy? Evan, Aaron, or Becky, can you guess what copper is used for that's very valuable? Uh, for electricity? I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's a really good conductor of electricity, right? And as you know, electricity makes the world go, right? So US-based copper mining did not like President Allende's policies towards its copper mining. 
For example, uh, President Allende wanted to ask U.S. copper mining companies to kick down more of their profits to help the Chilean economy. The U.S. owned copper company said, no, we're not going to do that. We love our super high profits and we like not paying too much in taxes. They didn't want to U.S. owned copper mines did not want to pay more in taxes to help build schools or roads. So in a very unprecedented move, Chile nationalized the copper companies. In other words, the Chilean government came in and took over the U.S. owned copper companies. And this was very popular in Chile. Most Chileans supported this. It was seen as a pro-Chile nationalist movement. Right? Whoa, how do you think the U.S. is going to respond in the 1970s of having their private companies taken over? I'll, can I pick on you, Aaron? What do you think? Are they going to like it or Maybe not? Maybe they might like it. They're definitely not going to like it. Yeah. So you know what happens? There's some sort of conflict, like maybe a battle oh. or something. So I encourage you to Google um, on your own Operation Fubelt, this funny word here, Fubelt. So what the CIA did, the CIA was born after World War II, and we'll talk about this more in depth in the third assignment. But the CIA was born after World War II in order to make sure the Soviet Union and communism doesn't spread uh, around the globe. <clears throat> so the United States did not like President Allende's policies. So in conjunction with the Chilean military, the United States CIA organized Operation Fubelt. And I kid you not, Chilean airplanes bombed the presidential palace, this is like the same thing as their, this is their version of the White House. And if you check out the like YouTube videos of this bombing, it's incredible. It's like over the big city of Santiago, all these planes coming and bombing the White House. <clears throat> and President Allende died in the bombing. Crazy, right? And what happened with Isabel Allende's family, they took off. They exiled themselves, they first moved to Mexico City then she eventually moved up to Marin County where she currently lives. So what replaced the democratically elected presidency of um, Allende was the dictatorship of um, Augusto Pinochet. And Pinochet's dictatorship lasted 74, 84, what, seven, 16 years. And it was super nasty. It was a nasty military dictatorship but what was going on in the world? How could the United States justify supporting a dictator and kicking out a president? What was going on during this time in the world? Do you all know about your 20th century history? Who was the United States' number one enemy in the, during this time? Go ahead, Aaron, you're muted. Unmute. Uh, it was uh, Osama bin Laden. Not yet, not quite yet. Osama bin Laden was actually our friend because he helped us fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. We'll look oh. at that in assignment three. We're not there yet. Um, during this period of time, we'll delve into much deeper in assignment three. It's an era called the Cold War, and it followed World War II. And the reason why we call it a Cold War, because it was basically the United States versus the Soviet Union, but it was called a Cold War because um, we did not nuke each other, right? So there was never, rarely US troops facing Soviet troops or bombing each other. However, throughout the world, all these places with X's on them, right? And you'll see Chile has an X on it down there, were places where this Cold War was very hot and very deadly, okay? We're gonna be exploring um, Southeast Asia and Vietnam in assignment three, and Afghanistan in assignment three, so we'll delve further into the Cold War. But what, during the Cold War, the United States supported many Latin American dictators, not democracies, in the name of fighting communism. And <clears throat> dictator Pinochet called President Allende a communist, and that's all the justification the United States needed to support 
Operation Fubelt, which bombed him. Isn't that crazy? This would make a good movie, by the way. You could do the Isabel Allende book part one and part two. You got to have the bombing of the presidential palace. So not to, it did not end in Chile with the killing of the president and the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. During the Pinochet regime, um, all these Chileans had been mobilized. All these students and workers had been mobilized by the positive policies that they saw positive policies of Allende. So they had to be crushed. So in something called Operation Condor, I, I encourage you to Google that if you want to learn more about it. 2,000 Chileans were killed or disappeared. Thousands were tortured and 200,000 exiled. In other words, 200,000 left the country. And that included the family of Isabel Allende, the author of the book. Here's a side note. <clears throat> You know, want to know one of the creepy, scary ways in which the Chilean government got rid of some of the most activist pro agenda people? They would capture them, put them in the big uh, soccer stadium and torture. The soccer stadium turned into this big torture pit. It was horrendous, right? It was like, it seemed like La Toro versus um, Valdivia all over again. And did you all finish the book to get to the part where how Pedro Valdivia died? Oh, Aaron, how did he die? What struck you about it? Uh, didn't they like eat his, like part of his body? Like, yeah, right. They like didn't uh, they do that? Or, say it again. Yeah. They uh, well, they definitely tortured him. Uh, they like ate him. So. Uh, they, <clears> Am I wrong? Or cut oh, body, cut off his ears and ate him. Woo. Isn't that nasty and yeah, nasty. yeah. She didn't make it that up. That happened. So just as there were the yeah. torturous, horrible yeah. ways of killings, um, one of the ways in which the Chilean government killed some of the anti-dictatorship people was they'd take them up in a plane and drop them over the Pacific Ocean. Whoa, crazy. Please don't believe me. I could be lying to you. Another thing that the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet did was reverse that law that gave the Mapuche cultural recognition, and it also reversed the law giving them land. So in 1974, in something called the Indigenous Peoples Law, um, all of the Mapuche lands was opened up to logging. This is an actual image of some Mapuche lands, and it's just gorgeous. If you're able to go visit Chile, I highly encourage you. It's a gorgeous place. I've never been, I've just heard. It's on my bucket list. So what this 1974 Mapuche uh, People's Law did was reverse, I, I'm sorry, lessen the Mapuche land even further. So my question is, did the Spanish conquer the Mapuche? Well, they're getting, uh, the land is decreasing and decreasing as the years progress. <clears throat> All right, Evan and Hannah, show off for Aaron now. Aaron doesn't know the course of today. What would La Toro do, given this indigenous people's law, taking away their land? What would he do? Probably fight. Fight. Boom. So one of the motorcades in which uh, the dictator Pinochet was rolling on in the 1980s was firebombed. They just got the wrong car. You know how when there's a presidential motorcade, there's a lot of the same car and nobody knows really which one the president's in or the dictator. So they firebombed the wrong car. Pinochet survived, but this is the level of violence in the 70s, right? It was on, okay? Fast forward to the 1990s, the Cold War ends, the Soviet Union breaks apart. It seems like the United States has no more of a big enemy in the world, right? The Soviet Union is no more. So what happens in Chile is that Mapuche once again take it to the streets in Chile and demand land reform and rights. Once again, the same thing that La Toro and other Mapuche were demanding, right? Here, here they are with their herbs. And this says in Spanish, somos chilenos, somos Mapuche. It says, we are Chil Chileans, we are Mapuche. 
right? It's taking it to the streets. Um, so in 1991, once again, the Mapuche occupied land owned by a lumber company. And you're gonna learn a lot more about current land occupations and the fight with lumber companies in the two films I assign in the big question about the Mapuche. In 1991, 22 Mapuche were arrested for painting a big mural in downtown um, narrating Mapuche history in a rather heroic way. Why would they be arrested for painting a, mur a mural celebrating Mapuche history? Why do that? Because the Chilean government doesn't want the Mapuche, they don't want, they don't want the Mapuche to have any, they don't want, oh my gosh. <laughs> they just don't want the them Mapuche, to stand up. yeah, they don't want them to stand up for anything. They don't want them to, they don't really want them to even live there. Yeah, exactly. This is an example of Mapuche pride right, and cultural recognition, and the Chilean government, at least most of the Chilean government, don't want that. They want them to be assimilated. They want them to speak Spanish. They want them to just stop demanding what they would say are these unimaginable demands. However, in 1992, the Mapuche said, uh-uh, we are not quitting. In 1992, the Mapuche adopt this flag. <clears throat> By the way, what's significant about the date 1992? For you math whizzes up there, what's 1992 minus 500? 1992 minus 500, you math whizzes. See, 1492 is when Columbus came. You can use your fingers if you want. Yeah, so on the 500th anniversary of the Columbus voyage, many Native American peoples all over the continent started to celebrate their pride, started to push back against 500 years of what they would call colonization. And just as Native Americans did here in the United States, the Mapuche started to um, right, demand more things. Here they are creating this new flag, this new old flag. And they start, um, and sure enough, Pinochet is gone by now, right? He stepped down in 1990. And once again, the Chilean government is passing a couple laws recognizing Mapuche culture. Here's the cent uh, cultural center for the Mapuche in Santiago. And they're still struggling, right? In the 1990s, there's some laws passed to recognize some Mapuche land. And here are Mapuche people still protesting, taking it to the streets. And when protesting in the streets in the 90s didn't work, Many Mapuche attack logging trucks, straight up going earth first, spiking trees. So what you do, you put a big, me big metal spike in a tree. So when the um, lumber machines come to take down the tree, it mucks up their machine, right? Logging machinery was burned, right? And in the post 9-11 era, the Mapuche were branded by the Chilean state as terrorists. And on one hand, if you see like, wow, look at the Mapuche burned up all these logging trucks. Yeah, it seems like terrorists. But to many Mapuche, they're continuing Lautoro's vision of protecting the lands. And as Ines Suarez said, I should hate them, but I can't. They are my enemies, but I admire them because I know that if I were in their place, I would die fighting for my land as they are doing. And this brings us to what I began the lecture with. Just as recently as October of last year, protesters here have beheaded the statue of a conquistador and tied it to the hand of Kaupulikan, the Mapuche warrior who won that the test of endurance. Last year, the bust at the um, gravesite of Pedro Valdivia was defaced, red paint splattered across his face. <clears throat> and still today, um, in the southern part of Chile, the county municipality is called La Toro. So for many Chileans, um, La Toro still survives, right? He's still out there. And now that we've come here, I want to encourage you to go to the... So what you're working on now... Whoa. 
Okay. Are the big four big questions of the Spanish invasion and settlement of the Americas. And if you scroll down to the near the bottom of the assignment for the big questions. Uh, pardon me. You're going to see these two films that I've posted. And I think these two films do a good job just updating you on the continued struggle of the Mapuche still today in Chile. And if you even Google some news reports about what's happening currently, I think it'll give you a lot of um, evidence that Mapuche are still fighting for self-recognition and La Toro's not dead. Okay, that is my lecture. I'd love to take this time for you to have any questions or what struck you about the lecture? So for the big questions assignment, I yeah. noticed that one of the questions at the end of the short questions assignment was the same as the big questions assignment. So are we just gonna take our answer from the short questions and elaborate more? Oh my gosh, so did you notice that? That a lot of the questions I ask you in the short questions relate directly to the big questions? Yes, that's why I wanted you to do the short questions, just so you can use all that work you did and like copy and paste and edit. Yes, you can use the same stuff. It's your work, you're not plagiarizing. It's totally your work, Hannah. So yes, I kind of look at those short answer questions as notes for these longer answers. Does that make sense? So yes, yes, yes. Aaron, questions or comments, or what struck you about this lecture? The second half, the part you saw. When you said they brought them into a stadium and pretty much tortured them to death. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. When was this exactly? I didn't really. That was the 1970s. Yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. So you can just Google. Yeah. Yep. Can you see the screen? So here's an image of. Yeah. Yeah. There it is, the stadium in which they tortured folks. Yep, the soccer stadium was turned into a and big these... torture chamber. Yeah. And they just tortured anyone who didn't go along with what they had going well, on? That's a good question. That's a good question. So let me answer it by going back to my lecture because in the interest of time, I went through it fast, and that's me not doing my job. All right. So remember I told you that Salvador Allende was voted with an over, uh, by a huge vote, he won really big. So all of his, are you seeing the screen right now? I forget. So all of his supporters were really hopeful and loving his economic policies. He was pro-student, pro-workers, pro-teachers, pro-Mapuche. So what happens with all these very hopeful politicized people when all of a sudden he gets killed? They are very upset. They take it to the streets, right? And when they take it to the streets and express their frustration with this dictator who killed their president, they need to be pacified or they need to be shut up. And the way they were shut up is through Operation Condor, okay? There are a couple very powerful movies about this. If you all watch um, the movie Missing, if you just Google, I just put it in the chat. <clears throat> if you Google the movie Missing, I'm sure Netflix has it. Um, and if you just Google like uh, Chile um, films, there's numerous films about this. Okay. All right. Evan, what struck you about this? This chat about the Mapuche in Chile. Can you... I gotta agree with Aaron with the soccer field. Oh, really? The soccer thing? Yeah. All right. So check that out. There's a very famous Chilean singer named Victor Jara, who was 
very, very popular. He still is one of the most popular artists in Chilean history. He was tortured in a very nasty way in the stadium. He ended up being a martyr for people who were against Pinochet. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, what strikes you? Or I'll even pick on Emma over there. I thought, like, the fact that, like, the Mapuche, although they were conquered, their voice was never silenced. Like, yes, their land was taken from them, but they're never going to stop until they're gone. Like, they're either going to become extinct or get their rights, I guess. Yeah. Um, what, hold on, I'm not seeing you. So that's a great line. Did you hear her? Their voice was silenced, but they were never conquered. I like that line. And if you want to quote Hannah, just put Hannah in quotations. H-A-N-N-A-H. Right? You're citing your source. Mm -hmm. I love when you cite sources. You get what you want to make me smile when I'm grading your papers. So cite your sources. That's a great point, Hannah. Any other questions or comments about the Mapuche or this lecture? Well, I do have a question about the big questions assignment. Sure. So it's like a giant essay sort of. So each question is supposed to be like several paragraphs and elab elaborately explained. So. Yeah, great question. So let's go to the top of this. So can y'all see, is it better if it's blue or not blue? What's easier to see? I think blue, but. Okay. So a successful big question assignment answer will offer a well-developed response backed by specific evidence from assigned material. And at last, <clears throat> in at least three paragraphs per question. And when I say in at least, right, C's do get degrees, right? But if you want to take it a step further, four paragraphs, five paragraphs, right? You'll pass if you do at least three good paragraphs. But I bet you all want to get A's. There is no limit. There is no limit to your answers. You may write as much as you wish. One of the students last semester wrote 25 pages. Damn. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to do it, let it go. Right? Let that crazy COVID brain of yours just do it. Write those pages. You don't have to. Answer the question in your own words. <clears throat> don't rely on quotes to make your point. You can use quotes, but don't have the quotes make the point for you. And also cite your sources. So Hannah, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And also I found a couple, <clears throat> if you want to do extra credit <clears throat> on Canopy, Canopy is the library's free streaming video service. This movie called Machuca is a powerful movie about how some kids dealt with the Pinochet, uh, the Pinochet regime. So you can find this for free on Canopy. For those of you who have um, Netflix or something else, I can't offer extra credit for it because I don't want to have you pay to play. But this movie called No, made in 2012, is a powerful movie um, by this Mexican actor, Gael Garcia is his name. I'm sure you've seen him. And there's numerous movies about it. So check those out if you want to just do some Friday night films about Chile. Okay. Any other questions or anything I can do for you? Because remember, I work for you all. Um, so are we citing for the big questions all the sources that we ever read for this? Or are we only citing the sources if we used a quote? No, uh, cite. When in doubt, cite. You cannot oversight. And when you do cite, you don't have to put it, you can just put it at the end of the paragraph, all your citations. You don't have to put it at the end of every sentence. <clears throat> okay? You can just cite like Rodriguez, Mapuche lecture. Um, agenda, page, yeah. So when in doubt, cite. Because 
as a social scientist, right, you want, just as a regular scientist, you want to um, show your sources. So if somebody wants to go check to see, you're just not making stuff up, they can go check to see. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Any other questions? No? All right. I'm going to end the recording.